Welcome to Civil War Digital Digest. I'm Will. Well, we're thrilled to be back at Greenfield Village at the Henry Ford, and I'm excited to have my friend Deb Reed, Curator of Agriculture and the Environment, back with us today to talk about more Civil War farming. As we talk about Civil War farming today, we're also happy to support Greenfield Village. 2020 has been a crazy year. Their Fall Flavors event has gone virtual, and we're excited to be a part of that program today. The other thing to talk about for a first time is this is the first episode since Civil War Digital Digest has announced the new strategic partnership with Alfam. I could tell you about it, but I'd rather turn to Deb, a past president of Alfam, and say, Deb, talk to me a little bit about Alfam. Yeah. Alfam, it's the Association for Living History, Farm and Agricultural Museums, began in 1970, so it's 50 years old this year, and is an organization that brings people to life. Uh, some of the folks that were involved from the beginning helped establish Firestone Farm. Uh, Peter Cousins was a president as well, curator of agriculture here, and the, the Firestone Farm opened in 1985. So we're out here in a cabbage field in the Civil War era in mid 19th century. Why cabbage? It is a healthy plant. So folks ate it uh, year round. Uh, today we know it has vitamin C and other health qualities then they knew that even vitamin C could help reduce scurvy. So it had merit. There uh, are varieties, different varieties, so that people could eat it year round. Uh, well, let's fresh. talk about the variety for a second. What do you, I mean, I see different shape, different colors. Yes. Why the diversity here? Well, so they had that yearly supply. They have early cabbage. So one of the varieties here is an early Jersey Wakefield. So it would be planted early in the spring and harvested midsummer to later in the summer. And then there are the later varieties that are planted now, meaning August. And okay. then they would be either harvested in the late fall or sometimes, depending upon where you are in the country, you could leave them in the ground through okay. the winter. Great, and I see a whole bunch of cabbage here. As I'm planning for my family, how much cabbage do I need? You need, uh, according to estimates, about three per person, but I would assume those would be very large heads. Probably closer to five per person would get you through the year. Okay, and now how would I choose? You've mentioned digging a trench and storing it oh, here. Yes. You've mentioned, mentioned other ways to store. How would I choose the way to store? In New England, for example, they had root cellars and there was a root culture, root cellar culture. So you would pull the cabbage up with the root intact and take it into your root cellar late in the fall. And it will, it will be there ready and waiting for you when you are ready for it. If you're in the upper south, or lower south, you might dig a trench, and then you would also pull them up by the root and lay them upside down in the trench and cover it with dirt. Not deep, just enough to give it some of that dirt warmth to keep it through the winter. Okay, and probably the best way we know to consume cabbage besides corned beef and cabbage is sauerkraut. Talk to me about yes. what sauerkraut is and why sauerkraut. Fermented cabbage, so a little bit of salt and no air allows it to ferment and uh, it'll, it'll take a month or so, and it'll last as long as you need it to last, understanding that you're consuming it. So it's, it, you know, in a couple of months, three months, and it'll be eaten and you'll move on. Uh, given that cabbage is there, you can make a new batch when you need it. So we've moved over to the Firestone backyard here and a yard like this, uh, I think is a good place to make slaw, isn't it? It's a perfect place outdoors in the bright light. All right, talk to me about what we have here to make it. We have a large slaw cutter or kraut cutter, and it would be proportionate to the crock. So a much bigger crock could work really well with this. The crock is a five gallon crock. Into that would go 35 to 40 pounds of cabbage uh, with no more than two cups of salt. Well, that, that doesn't sound like very much salt. No, it's a low salt fermentation process. So only two teaspoons of salt for every pound of cabbage. Wow, okay, so we've got salt over here. And what type of salt do we have? It's a pickling salt. You could use kosher salt, but pickling salt is what you need. Okay, That's what Great. everyone recommends. So yes. So we've got pictures of this in the 1865 Russell and Irwin catalog. So we see that these are for sale. How do we use them? We'll start with the cabbage and we'll get to the other pieces of equipment as they come along. Okay. Heads of cabbage. They vary in size, right? Because you have different varieties. Yep. 
large, tight heads of cabbage is what you need. So I'll, this is a men's job as well as a women's job. Okay. It knew no bounds. The first thing you need to do is take off the, the leaves that are outside that are either soiled, damaged. Okay. You know the, the saying about a uh, bad apple will spoil the bushel? Sure. So will bad kraut spoil a fermentation batch. So you want to make sure that you have nothing in it that needs to go to the pigs. Okay, so that, and that's, what, the, that's what we do with these loose leaves that might have a little damage. Yes, because you, you, some folks will use a leaf to, to top off the kraut, but you would only use the best of the leaves to do that too. I always believe that this is not waste, right? Because that pig will get in the pot and the sauerkraut will be really good with the pork. So you believe it, Deb. Is this something that you have experience outside of the museum world with? My mother taught me how to make sauerkraut. Wow. And uh, she came from a long line of Polish sauerkraut makers. But the system is the same no matter what culture you come from. You have to cut it in half first. Okay. And then quarters. Okay. So those, those knives look um, ready to be used. Let's go ahead and toss that back up and we should be able to see there. Yeah, so go ahead and we'll start with that big one. Let me start and here. Do I take the back no, off? No, I'm going to show you. Well, okay. yeah, you can cut that off. Right. And again, pig feet. Pig feet. And then cut it in half. Yes, you learn well. Cut away from you always and then quarter it. Ah, okay. When you cut a cabbage head, you cut it so that that, that uh, core uh -huh. is going to be quartered too, because that's the best part of the cabbage to eat. Great. Now, those are the perfect size that you can put in your kraut cutter. And I assume, wow, this looks like this has had there. a knife taken to it. <laughs> what should I be wary of? Uh, your fingers, for one thing, because there are four or five blades that if it's in working condition will be very sharp. So for me is as a beginner, insurance. this is probably a good thing for me as a beginner. And then... Yes, and pull it gently. Yeah, so now this is one of the reasons why it's good to have uh, it lower than you are and you're tall, so it needs to be here, but you're pushing pressure on it and it helps keep it stable over the crock. And, ooh, yeah, because I mentioned that that crock is big, or the cutter is big, the crap. Whoop, whoop, Will, you're... Oh, I'm yep. going off the edge there. There we go. So where's the knives? There we go. Okay. Here, we can put the other one in there and then yep. I'll take the... Well, so here we, oh, here's what we have. So you want this to be as thin as possible. Remember, the low salt fermentation needs to be able to get into all the kraut. So the thinner, the better. When we did it, we would cut it directly into the crock and then you'd take a butcher knife and cut it in the crock to make sure that you would cut through so the pieces weren't as quite as long. Okay. Yeah, and then you mix salt, not layer layer. Remember, it's just uh, two teaspoons to every pound, but you make sure that every piece of kraut is salted. Okay. So as soon as you get these cut up, then we'll put some salt on. And this is, we're just filling the surface area of the bin here, right? Yeah, and just be careful because... Absolutely. And then whoever's free in the family pitches in to help because this is going to go on for some time at five heads per person minimum. Yes, and there were no gender divisions of labor when it came time for doing... Uh, I'm going to cut that a little different. When it came time to do kraut, it was all hands on deck. Uh, depending upon the size of the crock, I mean, if you're not doing a large crock, it doesn't take long. And um, the folks around the house can do it. Uh, you also need to be cautious about sanitation. So okay. you made sure that everything was clean. Uh, we're going to put this back in here just for, you know, lack of waste. Uh, they would have been able to do that because they would have known everything was clean. Okay, so whether so, they know about modern hygiene, they knew that the kraut had to be clean, so they if, would have cleaned everything here working ahead of time. Yes, remembering that 
that adage, if a bad apple, it'll spoil the lot. So they knew that anything that got in there that was foreign would spoil it. So how would this be treated in different parts of the country and in different ethnicities? Where do we see sauerkraut being used? Is this north? Is this south? Is it different cultures? So yes to different cultures. Let's, let's stop and we'll salt it. Okay. So uh, cultures. Cult uh, the English had a word for sauerkraut. It wasn't sauerkraut, but it was the English derivation of it. So they're perfectly comfortable with sauerkraut. So, uh, but Civil War, there's a huge German population and German from all provinces of Germany. So that was uh, part of their cultural identity with sauerkraut. Is this a strictly European dish? I'm going to link cabbage more broadly. So the family from which cabbage comes is related to other things that are part of traditional Southern food ways and African-American food ways. So collards and turnips mm -hmm. are also kin to cabbage. So um, cabbage is a part of Southern culture. And in uh, WPA slave narratives and um, other records of plantations and Southern life, from the border states to the deep south, you find uh, reminiscences and correspondence about cabbage. Okay. Whether it's in boiled meals or whether it's made into kraut. So different ways to have it, but for now we're getting ready to make kraut. I see cabbage, I see salt, but I'm yes. missing a spoon here. Well, you're gonna use fingers and this is just the grab and go method. Okay. So um, when you grab, you grab a tablespoon or so. Okay. And that's perfectly fine for this quantity. So go ahead and, and use your fingers. This is another one of those. That's more like a tablespoon. That's perfect. Okay. And yep. So in a tablespoon, put, of course, is three teaspoons. Yes. I would go ahead and put more in. Okay. And then uh, <clears throat> put your hands in there. Okay. So this is one of these where you c carefully fluff it. Okay. Um, meaning you're trying to get the salt onto as many as possible and preferably all. And then you take your masher. I assume that's this big belly here. That big wooden thing. Now be very careful. Okay. But yeah, the point is you're just trying to get the liquid, not the liquid, the air out of it. So I'm pushing so that, all the cabbage down. Yes. So that it is as hard packed <laughs> as it can possibly be. And so, then you start again and you put another, you know, new layer, more salt and mash it down. By the time you're to the top and we're, we've got like three, three inches maybe before we need to top this off, uh, you would have brine that should be level to the kraut. And as it ferments, the kraut will sink down even though it's hard packed. And now that, am I making a brine and pouring it in? It'll create its own brine. The salt is drawing the liquid out of the cabbage and that's our brine. Yes. Now, if it gets low, in other words, if there isn't brine over the plate that we'll put on top of this eventually, then you need to add a, a salt water mixture, but it should make its own. Oh, actually I can see it starting to glisten. So yep. let's go ahead. There and... you go. Let me cut. You are very good at wielding that beast. Well, I have the advantage of looking down on it right now a little bit too. I can't tell you how many bits I've left of myself behind over the years. I'm trying not to do that. This is one of those you have to be so careful of every moving part. Depending upon the size of your family, you're going to go through this kraut quickly. The cabbage of different varieties coming good at different times, you'll end up with your late. About the time you're early is already out of the crock and in your stomachs, you'll have your late cabbage. Well, that on. would be part of the plan then yeah. too, to continue having food throughout the year and throughout times of year when you can't raise. Yes. So you just, you basically make kraut when it, when your crock is empty. The rhythm is good. It, it's filling it quick. When should we be checking? I think I'm going to leave you do a little bit more there. Okay, great. Just a little bit and then... The yeah. other great thing I'm finding is now that the cutter is getting wet from the cabbage, this is it's yeah. becoming a lubrication and this is working a lot better. Yeah, and then go ahead that, and I would do another one. 
and that really is all you need. I keep repeating, and it's worth repeating, two teaspoons to every pound. And this would be mixing that layer above that layer that you've just compacted to the rest of it. Yeah, and then go ahead and, and tamp it gently but firmly. <laughs> So then back to the cutting. Yes, and this is what re repetitive motion is part of the, the farm game, right? You do the same thing day in and day out. You have these seasonal activities like making kraut, which is something that you look forward to because it's a bit of a break from the routine. It allows the whole family to get together, plus neighbors, and you could share this work between yourself and your neighbors which would give a chance for community and a chance yeah. to get to see other people. Yeah. Let's go ahead yep, and pack it in. And I've been standing here yakking rather than cutting. So you're ahead of me. Only for a little bit. I'm sure that children in 1860 did the same thing. My brother and I would queue up when it was time for my mother to open the kraut when it was done. So after it had set for a month and she had, you know, daily monitored it, removed the scum continually, and we would stand there ready to get the first sip of the fermented juice. Wow. There's nothing like it. So if you could set that there and we will put another layer of salt on. Oh my goodness, look at that. We're getting near the top. Fantastic. So again, I'll pull this to level it out a little bit. Yes, and sprinkle that salt again. and then mix it up. And you, we might have a little salty kraut, but, and yeah, and then gently but firmly tamp because you need to be just always mindful that you have a crock and a crock is stoneware and it can break. And I guess this is a time to talk about one more modern piece that we do know now, and that is if you're looking to do kraut yourself, you're probably better to use a modern crock because older crocks, many of them were lead glazed. And lead glazed and sometimes cracked or crazed. So that also will affect the potential of getting your best kraut. Not only best kraut, but that cracking might allow lead to leach out yeah. into your kraut. So something that if you want to do this, I guess my recommendation, as much as I love things from the old days, start with a modern crock. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to put the rest of these in there. If it's a one more than you want, we'll take it out. And then uh, we'll see how we go with this. And because when we get it full, then the next exciting step happens, and that is layering plates and weights so that that kraut stays down <laughs> as it ferments and the air stays out. And so we've, we've processed three heads in what? A half hour, 45 minutes. We haven't been in any, in any hurry. Imagine uh, 40 pounds, so we've done, what, maybe six? So you can multiply to get a sense of how long it might take. <laughs> and that's good. Let's restock because you probably are nearly down to where we need to call it. Will we be able to use all of this or at the end will some of the rest of this go to the pigs just because of getting down? Well, um, so you have the wooden board on the, on the cutter. So we do not want wood in our crowd. That would be bad. Yes, so just a little more, and then I'll cut up in bits what's left. Yeah, and we didn't have as much in this one either. So, yep, just a little pinch. Okay, that's perfect. Sometimes you can, you can do this in a separate pan. Mm-hmm and then dump it in, and that doesn't slow you down at all. So okay. if you're thinking about this, and everything was time sensitive, you've got somebody who's cutting, somebody who's mixing, somebody who's stamping. Can be quite, come quite the assembly line decades mm -hmm. before the assembly line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, everybody had a role, and grandma might be the best for measuring the salt and knowing the ratio. I bet you tell them the stories. Yeah. I think that looks good. So I don't, yep, so that you can see even on the end how it's getting soupy. Um, it's not quite as briny as it will be, but that's because it's 
brand new and fresh. So what we do now is we would, under normal circumstances, have a cheesecloth, but you would put a scalded cheesecloth on the top of this and then that plate. So they have boards here too. Okay. And we only ever use the plate. Okay. But you can, um, obviously people use different things. I prefer a plate because there's no opportunity for anything to get into the wood. If you use a soft wood, that soft wood has, you know, bigger cells and, and if it's contaminated, moldy, it can transfer that to your fermentation, whereas so the a plate clean plate face won't. up or face down like that face down. Yeah. And yep, you would push it down and then you just remembering that there would be a cheesecloth there and then you set a rock on it carefully and that keeps it weighted down. Okay. So then you could cover it with another cheesecloth just to keep the flies off. Yes. Or uh -huh. a towel okay. would be perfectly fine. Um, and you would, before you probably put the plate on or put the rock on, you transfer it down to your um, the place you're going to leave it ferment. So ideally, 50 degrees or so for a month. Okay. And you're going to check it every day. So what tomorrow, are we looking for? yep, tomorrow you you would open it up, and that brine should be up above the plate, not over the plate, but above it, and that would be basically what you would do. You would make sure that it's beginning to ferment. And then as it ferments, it forms a scum. So you would actually take the rock off, take the plate off, take the cheesecloth off, usually dispose of the cheesecloth and put a fresh clean one and then relayer it. Again, scalded, taking that the boiling, yes. they wouldn't know for sure, but we understand now the scalding or the boiling would give you an extra sanitation step with that cheesecloth. Yes, yes. You're also gonna remove scum. So sometimes not for the faint of heart. You're gonna have scum and that is part of the process. It's supposed to be there. How do you know when it's done? You can smell it. <laughs> it's okay. one of those uh, cultural things. So it's not a look really, it's a smell. Okay. And texturally, it, it will continue to turn the color, you know, this like almost translucent beige, it, that'll happen but there's just an, a, an odor to it. Is there any way to learn that or do you just need to be around it? Uh, experience. Okay. So if you want to practice, you don't need 40 pounds in a five pound crock. You can do it in a little firkin, you know, a sm small, uh, with a quarter of a head of cabbage, just a tiny bit of salt and weight it down and see what happens. The refrigerator is too cool it won't ferment there. You have to have a room that's going to be main, you know, relatively stable at 50 degrees or so. What if you can't get to 50? For me, I've got a basement, but I'm going to be in the mid 60s most of the time. Yes, there. but that's probably your coolest consistent. It is. It is. Can I do that there? Mm -hmm. And then it just takes longer. Yes, and and put it in a northern corner, maybe. Fantastic. Well, Deb, thank you so much. Well, no matter what the region, cabbage and sauerkraut were a big part of food preservation and surviving a winter in Civil War era America. I hope this little look at how it was made and how the cabbage was cared for gave you a better connection to what life was like for so many Americans during the Civil War. Thanks for spending your time with us. We'll see you in a few weeks.